It is March the 2nd, 2024. I'm Chris, and this is the future of photography. The future of photography. Back with Jeremiah and Adrian. Good, uh, what is it? Evening. Good evening. Good morning. I'll, t- I'll take evening. Uh, yeah, it's actually light here now, so that's quite nice. It's, it's just, at least, it's just at not least dark we, anymore. We managed to, to, to meet at the right day because a lot of software fell flat on its face on the leap day we had just a few days ago before recording this. Um, it's, just, it's just amazing how weird, how bad some, some programming can be. Well, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, that reminds me of the Y2K bug. <laughs> that was what a wonderful time that was. I I I, I maneuvered by I, I was maneuvered directly into a burnout fixing things for Y2K. So not that good of a memory for me. Okay, fair, fair enough. Fair, I spent I enough. spent uh, uh, Y2K in the islands around Timor. <laughs> well, just so in far. case, yeah, away so from all technology. F- yes, uh, like on a beach for a month. <laughs> and then you're like, Didn't that know sounds what lovely. Was going on. It was fantastic. And then you come back to a world normalcy. And you find, you, you find it not burning and not crashed to pieces. Came ah. back, everything seemed to work fine. Technology. We deal Sweet. with technology every day when we pick up a camera. Well, I think when we pick up our phone. Well, or when we have something, I'm, I'm trying to find a good bridge to, to, to the topic that we want to talk about here. Um, I think I'm, I'm excited about today's topic because I'm reading a book about philosophy at the moment, and I've got a line into this topic that is philosophical. So now, okay. was it written by a human? So I believe so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> was it written by a robot? So so the title already says it. We are, we're we're going to talk about robots today and photography because. Th- if we if we look into the developments, I mean, we've seen developments, especially around AI, with a lot of um, well, the, the writing thing, the the chat GPT, the the picture making thing, the, the recognition, the, recognition, image recognition was first. So a lot of things that that you would uh, throw a picture at and it would tell you what's on it. This is now built into like my iPhone when I when someone sends me a photo on an iMessage. Um, my AirPods tell me what's on the photo. Such and such sent you a photo, and this is what it looks like. Nice. I so descriptions that, yeah. come through, and it's 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 making its way into, um, in into our lives. But then well, one thing that is still kind of in progress right now, and there's a lot of development, is robots. Well, and by the way, may I just say we all drive three of us uh, a robot, a robot. On wheel. On wheels, yeah, with all more, kinds of more, recognition. more robot in the U.S. Less robot over here on the other side of the pond. We're so sad for you. It's a regulation. Mine, mine's thing. very much a beta product. Goes wrong all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, robots, robots, and um, the, the robots on wheels, robots in factories, robots are starting. There's a lot of development in the humanoid robot area. Yeah. A lot of AI going into that as well. So. Yeah, yeah, we can talk about this kind of in a technical way, or we can talk about it in a philosophical, aesthetic way. Because uh, there, there is a, a piece, and we'll link to the show notes there, which is about teaching robots how to compose. Rule of thirds, Fibonacci sequences, all kinds of things. But can great aesthetics mm-hmm. be taught? My my instinct is you could emulate good aesthetics, and anybody who knows me knows I embrace fully <laughs> auto auto um, composition or robotic creation. I, I I love all of this and our relationship with it. But having said that, my instinct is you cannot teach original composition. You can as emulate. In- you could emulate. As in, as in, you cannot make a an AI write an original piece of work. No, I'm not saying they, that because I think you can. But that's a different story. Once we get to isn't that the same AGI? Thing? No, no. I'll, I'll give you an example. I think a few weeks ago, one of my picks was uh, an Instagram photographer called Gangland, 
it, it was part of our unremarkable um, show. Mm, yeah. It's just like kind of bland pictures. Uh, if I didn't choose him, then we should link him too. But but very, very interesting, very unique. A photographer who is on my current top 10 of, of image makers that I always, always am fascinated by every single shot he takes. And And these are just a, a way of seeing the mundane, the things around us, the, the plane. And, and um, his Twitter handle is, or X handle, or no, Instagram handle is is um, Gangland. It's Instagram. And I'm not sure that you could teach a robot what, what he sees to what a robot recognizes is irony. <laughs> and I, I use that word it's a difficult concept, right? very carefully. So there is kind of minimalist composition. We know what that is. That could be reduced to math, I believe. You could have rule of thirds, Fibonacci's, those kinds of things, things that are seen in nature. So you, you can mathematically create the conditions onto which every image must follow those concepts and end up with pleasing, if not really striking, images. Um, but it's very hard, if not impossible, to reduce irony into math. Because what is irony? Um, it's, a really, it's a very good question. Let's jump right into the thick of it there. Um, so you, you mentioned you know, uh, you know, people trying to train robots and yeah, the, the, uh, yeah, going back to the, the very first jumping point of this article, link in the show notes, an article of somebody who is training a robot to correct its composition mm. uh, based upon classic rules of photography. And this is a, a it's a, I don't know quite how to describe the, the robot. It's one of these sort of ones that is designed to look a little bit like a small child, right? It has a face and stuff like that. And what they've done is they've taught it to recognize what is a uh, a good composition and uh, a bad composition, and it finds a photograph that take that it can take, then uh, that then it will correct if it doesn't match up to what it thinks is a good uh, you know composition, it will reposition itself to improve the composition, and um, very much like an and it's, actual it's, human photographer. And it's using its in, its built-in camera. It's not picking up a DSLR or anything. Yeah, which is to be fair, if I had a built-in camera, I probably wouldn't bother to carry an extra one around. So you know, like it's yeah, I I I, I could be quite envious of that to be fair. Um, but uh, uh, hopefully, it doesn't also shoot lasers out of its eyes. It um, looks like it. <laughs> so, but you know, here's wait, a sidebar wait, question. Going back to what do you, say think they, do you think they make these robots to have people feel comfortable with the design of it? Hence a humanoid, more familiar thing rather than of course a they do. piece of kind of, you know, steel, rusted steel that's pure practical that just I hobbles mean, I, around. Look, look, at, look at this. This is the now robot and compare that with like Atlas by um, Boston Dynamics, for example, which is very menacing and yeah. would probably break your arm in a, in a, in anyway, a blink. Please, so. Continue. It's just, this sorry. Is, sorry. <laughs> so, so I'm thinking, well, this is how people learn to take photos, isn't it? Right. So we learn, we learn about some of the classic techniques of composition. So, you know, uh, and then, of course, we apply all of our, you know, human brain power and creative endeavor to, to, to do with that what we will. Um, or there's, there's a question perhaps around some of the more structured formal photography compositions, which possibly apply rules a bit too rigidly, but we'll, we'll park that for now. Maybe the robot would be quite good at winning photo competitions. Who knows? We um, talked about the, this in previous episodes. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. So. So I'm thinking, you know, the for me this is is absolutely a grey area, right? Because you know, I learned one of the first things I learned in photography was the rule of thirds, right? Possibly many of our listeners, that was one of the first things that they learned in photography as well. I so, never learned that. Did you not? <laughs> no, oh. because I never studied photography. And and by the way, my 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 experience with composition and those who make a living with it i.e. camera operators. So basically, you know, in film, I, you would set the composition, move through a 
a dynamic or a still kind of uh, formal of the camera. And then they'd shoot it. You could review on the monitor, etc. But over the course of my years, I have probably um, had disagreements that maybe led to one of our departures, meaning theirs, because they're, <laughs> <laughs> they're, the composition was, you know, they would clip something or they something would be on the edge of frame. Something that was, for me, really irksome, not minor, but irksome. And I, I would, you know, if it happens once or twice, you know, you just make a correction. Maybe they were off, didn't see it, whatever it is. But I found with certain camera operators, younger ones who didn't go through maybe a longer period of, of training, whatever it is, that they couldn't learn what it is I was looking for, which was not complicated. It just either a clean frame or a stacked frame or long, you know, whatever, whatever it happened to be. And um, so I, I, I quickly learned that you cannot teach it. It's impossible. And when I've taught photography, I, you can't instill. You, you can create a sort of formalism, but it, it's rigid. In other words, it's like composing uh, a jingle using, you know, AI. I mean, you could you could make something serviceable, but it, but it doesn't have that in you know that little instinct. On the other hand. When you work with camera operators who have an astounding sense innate of composition, every single frame is just a delight. And you just want to embrace them after every take because they, they will do things beyond and above what it is your intention was in the shot. So uh, I've been teaching photography for like 17 years now. And um, I've, I, I know people who who came to a workshop back then and who are still coming to workshops now. So I had a good look at the development of some people. And um, I, I find, yes, you can teach it, but it takes a long time. So at least some some formal elements you can teach. Formal. but But the, let's say, what I would call the, yeah, the or originality, the genius um, part, that is very hard to describe and is not teachable. You can't teach. It's that. instinct. It's instinct. It's a lot of instinct, and instinct in itself is a collection of like a lot of very um, ten thousand years of human yes. history, DNA, yeah. and the future perception so, and the present. <laughs> back to ro back to robots. So, can we teach a robot to take pictures? Um, I'd say. Yeah, in a formal way, probably. Yes, there, there's there's Gestalt theory and all all sorts of things that you can uh, bake into uh, a large language model. It's already happening, but yeah. um, mm -hmm. but the genius, the the spark, the thing that makes it art, I don't think so. But that doesn't mean that it it can't be useful. Like we're we're looking oh, at. Yeah. For for I, in some in some cases you can even trade quantity quality for quantity as in, let's say you have a surveillance robot that walks around all day and that takes pictures every second. Um, that is some quantity is quality, in or can spark quality if you have the right ways to sift through the haystack. Well, yes. Right. But here's here's a question for both of you. Would you like a option on your camera? that in pointing and shooting, just something very quick, would take it upon itself mathematically, mechanically, aesthetically, to adjust your composition to a, a formal, whatever it is, is programmed element. In other I, words, you have too much depth of field, you have too little depth of field. I Maybe. would argue that is already at least partially happening at this moment. I think it's happening in, in certainly in apps, isn't it? Maybe not in cameras oh, or maybe oh, not in dedicated the, the, cameras. But your, your but camera, your, your your smartphone will choose any picture out of like a five second time frame, yeah, yeah. which means uh, it it fixes your timing because it will choose possibly choose the one where the smile looks a bit nicer. 
Well, yeah. you know, that's funny uh, you say that because I was at a street corner yesterday in my car looking up at a billboard and it was a for Apple phone. And there were two pictures. There was a picture. It was a kind of two images of, of the same baby, one with their face kind of like, and the other one like, and, and basically it was like, take a great baby picture with your smartphone. Like, I wasn't sure whether they would actually artificially paste that smile on that baby's I face mean, or they would make that baby laugh. I, if, I, if, you look at, if you look at what's happening with FaceTime, it's already correcting our gaze to, it's to the look, eyes, isn't it? look yeah. in the camera. Yes. It fixes the eyes. So, so the, 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 the live, even the live fixing is in some ways. And now it's, it's not jerking you around and move, moving you a foot further to the left because that might, makes a nicer composition. But uh, parts of that are already happening. So, okay, so, so, so we can agree. Back. You can we teach can a robot to make aesthetic choices. I think I think a good robot I think a good robot photographer would be better than a bad human one any day of the week, right? So this is why I say it's a grey area. Maybe I should maybe I should qualify that and say maybe it's a sliding scale. Because you know, you can go to see some you know photo exhibitions and you just go meh, yeah, right. So yeah, anything, uh, uh, you know, and and you know, there's always that I could do better than that, thought, <laughs> right? Which yeah, you know, which possibly you guys might be able to, but as a as an amateur, that's possibly a little bit ambitious for me, but. The but the the th the fact of it is is that I could well imagine I could well imagine that you know you could train a a robot that was capable of movement capable of making compositional choices to do to to record a scene in a more aesthetically pleasing let's say way than than a a human could but I think then there's then there's the flash of, then there is the flash of genius to consider right so that you know and I don't know how we would teach this. I mean, mind, the question is: Do we need the flash of genius? That I, that's that's one of the main questions. I think if we if we categorize photography into this is art and this is just useful photography, then that that everyday utilitarian kind of photography, um, I think but, that can be taken care of by uh, by machine. Oh yes, I mean in surgery and traffic. No, not even there. Right. Not even there. There's there's robots already that you can buy for your studio for product photography. They well, are I, available. You put you you. This is where you put the handbag, and this is where you press the button, and then it goes. And a robot arm moves a camera, and the light sets it up itself. We up, will um, save that for around. one of one of our picks of the week. Hint, hint. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Let's do that then. Let's, so, 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 let, let's so we, we do we do episode. have that stuff already. It's there. So yes, I okay, but but I'm I'm thinking more of the 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 actual you know creative stuff. I mean, I'm there's there's a I have half a memory of a YouTube video I watched some years ago, and it was a, a photography YouTuber, and he'd always considered William Eggleston a person he really looked up to, and he actually got to go and interview him one time and spend some time with him, and they were sitting I think in a public park or they went for a walk with their cameras and stuff like that, and he said to him, he, he, yeah, I mean this is after the fact this video, and you say. You know, I had this amazing moment, like, you know, my, my hero, he saw spot a, a, a bin, you know, a, a waste bin, right, in, in a public park outdoors and went to take a photo of it. And he thought, now's, now's my chance, right? I can capture the same photo that, that William Eggleston ha, has made. And and he said, and Eggleston's was brilliant and mine was terrible. Rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> literally of rubbish. Yeah, literally <laughs> rubbish and, and metaphorically rubbish as well. So, you know, I... I they, I struggle to see because I can easily see all the stuff that yeah the 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 more technical and more formal stuff and things like that you know robots will get more increasingly more mobile they'll have increasingly better learning algorithms blah 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 right but where do we get to with that spark of genius is is that something are we going to get yeah. there well you can you can tell a robot mathematically to when photographing mountainous landscape. Always place the highest mountain in the center. <laughs> you could say that. So every single image will have a peak in the center. Well, that, that, that could be an art project in itself, <laughs> couldn't it? Yeah. I mean, some of them will be brilliant. Some of them won't. And you could say, only photograph this with a red filter in black and white with dynamic sky contrast. Well, right? and, then, and then we end up with a, trying to find the needle in the haystack again, which only works and which you only can automate 
like 10,000 mountain pictures, you can only automate that if you know what you're looking for, what the needle is. So you have to know <laughs> what you're looking for, uh, which that, that, makes yes. it difficult again. Mm. Yeah, and, and would that be true if the robot was confronted with miniatures? <laughs> anyway, the the <laughs> the other the other Edge question cases, is, yep. <laughs> but I don't think I'll go back to what I've repeated. I do not think you could teach a robot to spot, you know, a piece of abandoned fabric on a sidewalk. You know what I mean, with the shadow crossing it, and no, but just imagine you you're having a family gathering and your your service robot that. I don't know, washes the dishes and, and hoovers the floor, um, picks up a camera and takes a nice family shot, and that is just fine. Well, by the way, waiting? that exists. That exists. They're called photo booths that people hire for <laughs> for mm -hmm. parties. Yeah, there's that. And, and they're uh, very popular. And and I mean, that's, you know, we're, we're just iterating it one step up, which is like, oh, yeah, we, we rented a robot photographer face recognition it knows everybody I mean, there <clears throat> you get wedding, wedding photography here's a good example there is a gazillion uh photos out there that can be used as training material and all weddings are very similar in their photo photographic yeah. output at least most of them you have very typical photos of the bride and the groom and the cutting of the cake and the kiss and the ring and stuff <laughs> that is all so so Obviously, a, a robot photographer, having been trained on 25,000 weddings, will be a good wedding photographer. Yeah, sure right? it will. Yeah. And make mine extra dreamy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I, and by I, the yeah, way, I, ironically, I ironically, this is a, a funny uh, bit, but many years ago, when I was kind of starting out, I was an art photographer, blah, blah, blah. But... Some artists had hired me for very little money to photograph her wedding. And the boy was I the wrong choice because I did like all the most bizarre, like Diane Arbus shots of her wedding. And I thought they were, I still have the negatives. They were so funny. Of course, never spoke to me again, but um, the pictures were great, but you can't get a robot to do that. Maybe you can, but it would be happy accidents. In other words, you would just keep shooting well, and shooting. Depends, and shooting all depends but... on the training data. So Yeah, that's true. There In is other words, a, there keep... is an Asimov story. I think it's an Asimov story. Um yeah, one of the one of the, the short robot stories. Uh, and it is about um uh a, a robot that is a, a sort of house servant robot, but it's very good at creating art. And uh its owner, a lady, ha has a dinner party. Uh, and you know, and and this this robot has built up some level of reputation in the art world and stuff like that. And one of her guests is like a robot mechanic or something. And he, and as he's leaving at the end of the dinner party, uh, you know, they uh, he says, "Oh, oh, by the way, I fixed your robot because I noticed it was broken." <laughs> and I think it was I can't remember if it was pitched as like a who done it or then or then somebody committed some sort of crime around it or something like that i don't know exactly that like maybe maybe the the mechanic had been murdered or something like that and it was a whodunit but the, the the point being of course is that the reason the robot was creative was because it had a it, it was different from the design right i won't call it a defect because it that the whole the whole philosophy of the story is was it a defect or not right but but it it had a a, a mechanical or you know or a, a real world thing that was different from its design and therefore it was behaving differently and therefore it was capable of creating lots of art and i'm thinking you know give this little robot you know the, in, in our in our you know uh, article here right uh, a random ja number generator in its in its code somewhere and and see what happens yeah. <laughs> i you know yeah i mean i i uh I've been researching uh, robotic sculpture uh, machines, mainly by Kuko. And um, it, like, I can really see training robots to be uh, studio assistants, you know, to clean and uh, maintain printers, for example, or applying um, levels of glaze, things that are purely mechanical, even shading colors, uh, you know, with samples. I, I could see that. Um, happening where artists are using trained robots 
in place of their large staffs, which, you know, traditionally um, a lot of these artists had, a, you know, big students and to fill in, you know, the blanks. They would, you know, they would be working on massive canvases and the artists would sketch out the... Uh, the big picture and start to fill it in. And then the students would come and apply the kind of final detail. And, you know, here we have, there's a. Oh, even art. famous painters were, were, are known oh, to have done that. Especially yeah. famous painters. They had the money to run a studio. And, and they here, had the, and they had the, the, the sales to fill up that yeah, kind of award. That's right. Or the yeah. patrons. And, and, uh, you know, here um, in, New York, there's a wonderful sculptor, Barry X Ball. Just just imagine a photographer with a with a studio full of like 18 robots holding lights and moving things around and I would love it. Ap applying makeup and stuff. That would, would be awesome, it. right? Awesome. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> Adrian's <laughs> making his faces again. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's not awesome. That's yeah, yeah. yeah. And by the way, like when they a, when they broke, you just hire another robot to come and well, fix them. Well, if right? if they are all the Isn't same, they do just another one will take over, interest. right? Yeah. I. I yeah. <laughs> so, so that's our future. <laughs> no, 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 no. So that 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 worries me. So so it worries me in a lot of ways. But but it, it, one of the things, just borrowing from my professional career, we have a um yeah a, a, you know, a, as a business consultant type. You know, a lot of the way that you learn the the profession or the trade, uh, you know, a, as a junior is by being with the people that are more experienced and being with the clients, usually in the client's offices several days a week and stuff like that. And that's how you learn all of the subtleties and nuances in the thing rather than just the methods and processes. That's now gone literally overnight with the lockdowns and it's never coming back. So, you know, your large, you know, your massive consultancy companies and professional services companies be they technology based or other things you know they, they there's a real issue which is how actually do we educate and train the next generation so okay. if you filled your studio with robots would that not then be a very short termist view and it would absolutely you know um, cut out all of the learning and experience that goes to make some of the wonderful artists that we have today well, that's certainly true, but uh, but the other question, a more a more interesting question socially, is what do we do when the majority of the populations are unemployed? What happens then? Oh, here comes our dystopian slant. <laughs> well, no, it depends. It Tricky depends. Game. In your projection, are we in a are we in a post scarcity society where actually the reason they're out of work is because they don't need to work? Or is it, are you talking about the interim state when we're on the way there, where possibly it is a little bit, let's no, call it less I'm utopian. I'm really talking about like, like, for example, you know, McDonald's would like nothing more than to have their entire system run by robots, uh, Amazon as well. I mean, they, you know, these large They're already doing it, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> these large companies, having humans, you know, um, is a rather, you know, annoying thing for them. They have to negotiate, they have to pay fringes. They Reason have to, to be healthcare. confident that nobody ever left a job at McDonald's thinking, oh, I wish I'd kept that. <laughs> By the way, any repetitive job that's boring is a job that is endangered by robotics. As in the question, wedding photographer, right? Well, you can, you can, can make very that repetitive. Argument. You can. <laughs> how, ch children's programming writer <laughs> you know so i i'd love to i uh, yeah if i was getting married again which hopefully i will never have the need to do um i uh i'd love to have a robot like do like the the boring like you know formulaic you know this is the bride and the bridesmaids this is the groom and the parents-in-law and blah 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 that would, and and then have somebody like an actual person running around just doing like fun candid documentary stuff you know that that would be the the soul of it, or... and that person would cost as much as all the other robots together. <laughs> or, or you do what many people do: is you buy all the disposable cameras, hand them out to everybody. Everybody toss it, shoots all night or all day, and tosses it in a bin. You process the picture, does digitize it, and that's your fun album. Sure. All from everybody's mm -hmm. point of view, it's a great way to work. All right. But, Anyway, they, I think what we're we're really talking about is the mechanics 
of photography and robots, robotics, what I call shots and bots, uh, is, is something that's the title that should be that, that, that. I, I can see that happening uh, because it, it, these are things that can be taught. But I do not believe that you can teach a robot quirky, ironic humor. That comes out of a very weird, humanistic, synaptic, you know, just the study of comedy. What What is ironic? What doesn't quite work? Uncanny Valley, all the rest of it. Those are things that are in the ether that I don't think at this point we can teach that. Now, with general artificial, inte you know, intelligence where they can teach themselves things and start to have virtual experiences or experiences through humans. Maybe they can learn what feels like irony, but I can't describe to you why a joke is funny. So, how can well, I? some AIs can. <laughs> I haven't seen one yet. I've seen them do All a right. lot, but not humor. All right, we'll we'll have to we'll have to revisit this uh, in a. In a few years, maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe after the photography show, because uh, Adrian, <laughs> you will visit the photography show um, in the UK. Yeah, which there? is in two. As we record this, it's two two weeks today. I'm afraid I will not be here for recording of the show because I will be enjoying uh, the. You'll photography be our show. correspondent. I will. I go take my microphone and make yeah, and you know, make some roving reports and stuff like that. And see what, <laughs> it's, see what's going. It's a lot of work, um, but uh, you work. will you will bring us stories of robots doing photography. I there will. Must, indeed. There must be stuff. Some some technology there for sure. Well, it, they may not look like people, but you know, <laughs> automated drones and stuff like that. That's all robots, yeah. isn't it? That's so, yeah, and they are exists. photographers. All right. Yeah, yeah. Let's move on to our. Picks of the week. Um, I brought one that does nothing to do with robots, but a lot with photography. I'm not sure we talked about this photographer here. It is um, about Prokutin Gorski. Heard of him? Nope. Nope. <clears throat> he is the first photographer who took real color photos. Some of these photos are from 1905. So he was Ooh, uh, okay. in Russia. He um, he developed a method that would use um, color filters and a large plate that could hold three photos. So he would take a red, green, and blue shot after, uh, like in succession, and then <clears throat> they would be projected onto a screen with three color filters again. And um, the results are very mesmerizing because you you know how how photos are very like like if you take an old black and white photo and you um let's say you 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 colorize it and you up res it and you fix it using in some software that's already interesting but looking at these pictures as they were taken mm. at, without any any later adjustments um it makes them even closer, even realer, I think. Mm. So They're beautiful. Um, there's, there's a, his photography correct, a co collection um, is at the Library of Congress, and it's public. And what you can also do is you can download some of these in their original format, as in the three red, green, and blue plates. So uh, you can go, and I mean, honestly, if you if you add them up in Photoshop or something as a red, green, and blue channel, and you have to line them up, then you are already doing a bit of an interpretation because you certainly do not have to have the exact color filters that they had back then. But um, it's fun to to play with that if you're a bit tech inclined. Um, try it out; it's it's cool. We'll link to that collection in the show notes and um, the oldest color photos out there impressive like stuff it. that's so did fabulous. he invent that that's that's known as the trichrome process i think isn't it did he invent that there is a process that then makes that into pictures as into actual pictures i think he didn't make them into pictures he only projected uh -huh. them as far as i know it would be like a dye transfer ish kind <clears throat> of sort of yeah. way to do it yes sort of wow so okay interesting 
again, around 1900, that's fairly early for color photos. Yeah. All right, next up is Adrian. What is this one about? The Pentax Film Project. Yeah, so I think we've talked about this on the podcast before. So yeah, uh, last not 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 last year anymore. Actually, I think back in late 2022, uh, Rico Pentax started. But yeah, we started hearing some rumors about them going to make a new film camera. Uh, and it turns out that actually there's, you know, it's, it's not only is it true, but they're progressing it and, and they're partway through prototyping and things like that. So this video, uh, which has, um, I think as we record, this was released just yesterday, is the latest vlog or, uh, you know, update from the, the Pentax team about just exactly what they're trying to make. Um, and it explains, you know, they're, they're trying to make it, you know, for film photography, make it easy for people who've not done film photography before. And that's, you know, and, and they're thinking targeting young people as well. And and so that's driven some of their design choices. And, and with this video is an update on some of their design choices. So it, they're now saying it's a, it's a half frame camera um, for two reasons. Uh, one is because actually the majority of young people today do shoot in a vertical format, you know, with their phones. <laughs> cool. Uh, and so they are addressing and, and adopting that aesthetic as their default. So a half frame camera will absolutely do that. Uh, another reason is, is of course, they're mindful that uh, film is a lot more expensive now than it used to be, you know, 20 years ago when everybody was using it. So that's, um, that's, uh, and, and uh, using a half frame camera means you can get double the shots on your roll of film, which means that you know, your cost per shot is halved. Uh, so that's, that's good as well. They talked about and they talked about a uh, it being auto exposure, um, so that's so it'll have auto exposure in it with a decent quality shutter and timer. Uh, they've talked about it being zone focusing uh, with some sort of display in the viewfinder uh, about how yeah you know, what zone you're focusing in, and they also made reference. They don't say what lens it's going to have in it yet, but they said they've been inspired by an old pocket Ricoh camera from decades ago. Um, I, I had to look it up; it wasn't one that I'd heard of. Um, and it had apparently a 25 millimeter lens, which, of course, on a half frame is the equivalent of a 50, roughly. So it's going to have a, a, a 50 mil equivalent lens. <laughs> it's fun to hear that a big camera manufacturer is looking into making a film camera. It is. Yeah, I it like is. that. I like that. All right. And last but not least, let me open yours, Jeremiah. Ah, as you were talking, <laughs> the robot. This is uh, basically here you go. So that is that is uh, that is a commercial photography for yeah for commercials um, using things that move cameras and props around, as in like food photography as or flying can, flying glasses see. and things. Yeah, yeah. very simple setup. <laughs> But uh, yeah. very effective. Uh, you know, my gut is soon to be replaced by AI, but um, that's another discussion. <laughs> I think that I think the um, this is the perfect use of robots, like so to the, make a pour that's absolutely you know one point two ounces at forty five degrees and infinitely repeatable. Infinitely repeatable, <laughs> yes. And the light subject to flashing. fluid dynamics, of course. Well, that's the. Uh, isn't that always the, the same? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, so the robots are here. That's what you're saying. They are. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So this oh. is the studio full of robots that are doing all the manipulation of props and lighting and and things that you know to take a shot. Yep. All right. Well, there we go. Robots. Wonder what his day rate is. <laughs> Um, I, I wonder what know, his kit hire bill is that he passes on to his clients. Yeah. I do know that the um, tech YouTuber MKBHD also has a photography videography robot arm, one of these bolts or whatever they are called. Does and, he? Uh, oh, right, yes, okay. he does. And he's, I think he sparingly uses them. But if you see like product shots with a camera like flying over a desk with a smartphone on it. Um, that is often done with the robot. He, I've, he did an entire feature about it when he bought it a few years ago. So mm, missed that one. these YouTubers make way too much money. <laughs> well, he does very well. I mean, he's an he's yeah, astonishing fan of that Marquez Brownlee, isn't he? He, yeah. he? he really is. Yeah. All right. Robots and photography. I think that brings us to the end 
of this episode. Um, again, this is a topic we will revisit because it it will make itself heard and seen over the next years for sure. Um, if you look, especially if you look into like the humanoid robot world, that is kind of a bit in the next in a, in a Cambrian explosion phase right now. Um, <laughs> there might be. A, a, fo a photography robot coming and pick up, pick up a Fuji camera and do things. Anyway, this is it for today. You can find us online at thefuturephotography.com on our Discord. And um, yeah, we'll be back soon. Until then, everyone, take care and bye bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. <laughs>